half. So I've, and we're a couple minutes behind schedule, so we might as well get started. Um, so hello again, everyone. My name is Nick Kramer. Um, I work with Jenna and Paul and Margaret and John at the Council on Rural Development. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. I think rethinking employment is one of the um, more intriguing and innovative titles we've had in these sessions. So really looking forward to seeing where the conversation goes and um, also just looking around the room, see some really deep uh, expertise and, and diverse representation on in this group. So I'm excited to hear everybody's reflections and um, yeah, see where things go. So I, I will just reiterate for the sake of um, <laughs> drilling it to death what Jenna said a little bit in the opening. This really is not a top-down process, right? We are here as neutral conveners. We're lucky enough to have a number of really uh, deeply expert members of the visiting team with us tonight, some, some really expert um, participants, but this forum is primarily about you guys, the participants, and um, hearing the, the challenges on the ground in Washington County, what's actually going on. We're not here in any way to kind of dictate the shape of recovery and um, really much more to gather ideas and, and leverage the grit and ingenuity of Vermonters which is what makes this place such a great place to live. So um, really want to just thank you all again for being here. That being said, I'll, I'll take a minute to introduce or at least acknowledge um, the members of the visiting team we have with us tonight. I'll let them do a more uh, in-depth introduction for themselves when they speak. But briefly, we're fortunate to have with us tonight Ted Brady, the Deputy Commissioner for the Agency of Commerce and uh, Community Development. So thanks, Ted, for being here. Really looking forward to, um, Ted's gonna actually kick off the conversation for us in a couple minutes here with some of the things that they've been seeing from the agency's perspective over the last couple months um, within this arena and get things going. So thank you, Ted. Um, we also have with us Jamie Stewart from the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation. Thank you, Jamie, for being here. and. Um, Looking forward to hearing some of your reflections towards the end of the call um, and on the conversation. We have, I'm just scanning, I don't have my glasses on, so I'm just, I'm sort of a blurred outlook. I, we're, I think, is Diane? Yeah, there's Diane. Diane Derby from uh, Senator Leahy's office is with us tonight. So thank you, Diane, for being here. Um, for we're me. definitely looking forward to hearing some of what the, uh, what's up in Washington and, and what might trickle up in this arena our way. So um, looking forward to that. And finally, I want to acknowledge uh, Claire Rock from the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Claire has graciously agreed to be note taker tonight. So she'll be instrumental in helping us capture all of the um, innovative and creative ideas. And so thank you, Claire, for being here. And it's good to see you again. Claire and I used to work together. So um, I'll get into a little bit more Zoom housekeeping stuff in a second, but I think I've probably talked for long enough at this point. And so I'd like to turn it over to Ted to uh, get us started with some of what they're seeing from the agency's perspective in this arena. And um, Ted, you have the floor. Well, thanks so much, Nick. And looking through this Zoom call, uh, I see people with uh, as uh, much experience and more in responding to this crisis than I have. So please, Forgive me if anything I say is repetitive or redundant, but uh, perhaps it'll simply be reaffirming to say, oh, yeah, I agree. Um, but I, I wanted to just talk about kind of, I don't know, the stages of grief that our economy's gone through. Uh, and it's not your typical stages of grief that, uh, that you're familiar with. Uh, I, I frame it in kind of a, a four-part process. One is shock. Uh, two is uh, adaptation. Three is response, and then four is resilient um, planning. And uh, I think right now, uh, at any time, uh, much like the scale of grief that a counselor might talk to you about, they don't come in order. <laughs> and you can go backwards or forwards and ping pong all around. But I wanted to share a few observations that we've made. One a big, huge picture, right? We think that uh, this pandemic has about a billion dollar impact on our economy every month. 
Um, that number has certainly uh, shrank a bit uh, since we've been able to reopen considerably, but not that much because our billion dollar number was conservative. And recognize we have a 30 plus billion dollar state domestic product. So it's, it's not about $30 billion of our GDP is gone. It's about a billion dollars of economic activity that's gone and that's different, right? There's a lot more than $30 billion of economic activity that happens in the state of Vermont. And that's why we all get to claim that we're all worth doing $2 billion worth of work. Uh, but when you look through these four stages, right, we had shock at first, and we had this crisis where that billion dollars happened. People had no idea what to do. And in the first, uh, the, the first five days after uh, Friday the 13th, or really uh, March 17th, when the executive order kind of became very clear that it was happening, and then 20 something, the Agency of Commerce received more than 5,000 inquiries from businesses about what they're supposed to do. And it shows that suddenly people were back on their heels. And you had businesses that just shut down, they closed. They didn't take the time, they didn't have the time to say, oh, how can I adapt? How can I respond? They're like, whoa, okay, I need, a, I need some time off. And you still, seeing, you still see the shock happen occasionally. Maybe you read in the news two weeks ago or a week ago when, um, when uh, the farmhouse closed, right? The farmhouse restaurant had to close because they had an exposure at their restaurant. They made that decision in shock. Like, okay, we don't know what to do. We need to stop. It wasn't because they had to do it. The government didn't tell them to shut down for a couple of days. They made that decision. You still see people slipping into shock. But then quickly after that, within days, we saw adaptation. We saw people moving to curbside delivery. You saw people moving to uh, uh, online services that they never did online before. You saw people doing phone uh, orders and doing delivery to people's homes. Uh, it was really an amazing piece of ingenuity that people all of a sudden came up with. Uh, and that adaptation kind of is that immediate thing, okay, how do we just survive? And we saw pizza places delivering pizzas to cars from their driveway, uh, in their driveway. We saw um, uh, things like chicken barbecues at the 4th of July or Memorial Day convert to take out chicken barbecues. Really interesting, quick thinking, okay, we can do this still, but we don't, it, it's not going to make money. And this is a really important thing. All these changes generally haven't made businesses money. Um, because a restaurant needs a certain number of people to eat there. A hotel needs more than 50%. So no matter how much of one of these places adapts, they can't make, it go, make a go of it. When you look at a, uh, a hotel adapting, uh, it's just, it doesn't work. You're still at 50% of your numbers currently. So then I think I go into this response thing because I think every business has said, okay, how can I make a buck off of this crisis, right? Because you say, I wonder what do people want different? And what might change habits change going forward? And you see uh, up in Burlington, this uh, a, an Internet of Things incubator kind of popped up, and these people are making technology solutions. So, as an example, uh, a counter uh, of people that go into a space tied to software, tied to a capacity restriction, so that in real time a business owner could say, oh. I've reached my capacity, you need to wait. Or even better, they can broadcast that capacity out to the world to say, don't come right now, wait 15 minutes until my capacity goes down. And you see businesses doing things, really interesting things like that. Um, and that's kind of that response. And then we get to resiliency and, and you see some, some good resilient planning going forward. And that's what the Small Business Development Center, they, they have this great disaster planning series that started out with disaster planning 101. I think they're up to disaster response like 1900. Maybe Curtis knows the exact number, but they've issued like 19 policy papers or uh, uh, technical assistance papers on how to respond to the disaster. And you see things like the first place I saw it was in Montpelier where the downtown association said, and this is in maybe week three or four of this crisis, they got to their uh, uh, resiliency planning almost immediately we're gonna close down our streets in Montpelier and we're gonna have a drive-in theater. Uh, you know, that, that was happening three or four weeks into this, those crazy ideas. You see a place like Thunder Road, uh, which 
uh, in all candor, is constantly pushing the boundaries, but they're doing it in a way that says, we can do this safely. Tell us how, does this make sense? Can we put up these ropes? We have these separate groups of people in you know four or five different steps, sets of people now outside, socially distanced with private, with their own bathroom, their own concession area, really trying to build something that can last uh, uh, through the, the summer and through the winter. You see a ski area that came forward to us and said, we recognize our lodging will not, we're not gonna be able to make a buck in lodging this year because unless we can get Manhattan and Cambridge coming to uh, our ski area, we're not gonna fill up rooms. And so they said, we're gonna convert our entire uh, hotel into ski cabanas that people can come and use for the day. And it has this great dual purpose of uh, putting money in their pockets for using that space, but also they're seeing that we're probably gonna have to restrict the number of people in a ski lodge, right? At a base area lodge. And they go, how can we make this work to our advantage and, and, and hopefully get our bottom line so it's near black? Again, it's maybe not in black. That's the really horrible thing. So these four stages, we see people bouncing through them constantly. Um, so that's on kind of the economic development side. What I wanted to also talk about was the labor side, because we're talking about both uh, employment and economic development tonight. You know, we're all thinking the same thing you're thinking. Will we ever go back to what we were, were before? Um, when we look at we still have tens of thousands of people on unemployment in Vermont, mostly in the hospitality and restaurant sector, uh, but but certainly scattered throughout. Um, and you say, will we ever go back and will we build our economy back to a point where we can get to, back to 3% unemployment, 2% unemployment? Uh, we, we obviously are trying everything we can. We just launched this great consumer stimulus program uh, that sold out in a day that shows that people have an appetite to get back out into the service industry and use the service industry. We need to give them permission to do that. But we also wonder what does at home work look like? Will we ever go back to uh, full occupation of our office buildings? And if we don't, what does it mean for our downtowns? What does it mean for the uh, future of every downtown in Vermont that has a state office building? Currently those state workers are mostly working from home. Even when we go back to normal, are we at 100%? Are we at 80%? Are we at 50%? What change does that have on the sandwich shop in town? All of these things need to be planned for, and we need to start doing some work to, to, to figure out what the, the future looks like. So that's it in a nutshell. I just wanted to get people realizing that uh, we're all, I see everybody on this call has been involved in the COVID response to a level that probably has made them sacrifice time from their families, from their friends, from their hobbies, from sleep, from God knows what. And what I'm surprised about is that any business owner is possibly still healthy and alive after doing what I've been doing 10 times, what you've been doing 10 times over. Um, but I did want to end it with what we're doing about it and what we're trying to do and what we need your help doing. So one, I mentioned this consumer stimulus idea. Vermonters want to participate in our recovery. And so what can Washington County do? I know that uh, we, we just launched a, uh, a, a regional marketing campaign where Waterbury once again and Montpelier once again uh, came with great ideas about how they would spark some uh, innovative stimulus ideas in their town with downtown bucks and things along those lines. Uh, we launched the stimulus program that could potentially put $50 million of stimulus into our downtowns, put hundreds of dollars into the hands of every Vermonter so they can go and invest in their local uh, economies. We're recognizing there's tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of additional need out there that if we don't provide grants to businesses to survive in the hospitality sector, they'll disappear. And we're not talking about those that were on the fringe before, we're talking about big regional players that won't exist. Uh, and we are about to launch a big technical assistance program with Jamie, the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, uh, and others, where businesses will be able to get help building websites, getting on QuickBooks, you name it, to a level they've never had access to before. We've got a good technical assistance network in the state, but we're trying to boost it. So we need your help doing all those things. Always end with a call to action, and the call to action is to uh, Senator Cummings and Representative Reed and others on the phone, we're 
firing all cylinders with you and we need more help to keep all this going and to the downtown organizations, bring the creativity, challenge us to do things you've never done before, uh, challenge us to think about problems the way we've never done before and to use state and federal money the way we've never used it before. Thank you, Diane Derby. Um, I'll stop there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, I think there's obviously so, so much to unpack in, in that. And um, that's, I think, a really great starting point for the conversation. So really looking forward to getting into more detail um, on all of that. And thankfully, we have 70 minutes to do it. So before we launch into the conversation, I want to just, um, as promised, go over a couple little Zoom housekeeping things. I'll, I'll start with a disclaimer. I think I'm realizing I'm having the surreal experience of looking at like half black squares and then everybody else is frozen. Usually I try to make it into Montpelier to either the office or a friend's house with better internet for these calls. And I tried, I was feeling brave tonight. I'm, I'm zooming from Corinth where I live and we are, we are not in the, the broadband highway. So um, if I have a, any sort of weird social faux pas or I'm not acknowledging somebody who's waving a hand, just know um, it's, it's a connectivity issue. So that being said, a couple of things, I think we're doing so far a really great job. I will just ask everybody, please um, try to stay muted when you're not talking. That just helps minimize the unforeseen barking dogs and crying babies and everything else we all um, have come to know and love in this virtual era. Um, and then the other thing, I think since we're a medium-sized group, uh, what might be helpful is if we do try to raise hands, just if you want to speak. Like I say, I will do my best to, to uh, observe flesh and blood hands, but um, everybody is frozen. So, so no guarantees on that. I will propose a slightly higher tech alternative. If everybody, if you, uh, for anybody on the computer, you scroll over the bottom of your screen, you should see a little icon that says participants. If you click that, a little sidebar should pop up. Um, or a floating window, and then somewhere next to your name or maybe at the bottom of the list, there should be an option that says raise hand. And if you click that, what will happen is a little uh, blue virtual hand will pop up next to your picture. And that will just really help me to see sort of who's in queue um, and make sure we don't lose anybody's voice in the conversation. So um, <laughs> silent frozen faces. If there's no uh, pressing questions on that, I, I'd say let's get right into it. Um, just to give kind of a, a, an overview of where the conversation's going, we have a loose script of about four questions. We're going to start by talking about challenges, that the real conditions that you're seeing on the ground in this arena. What are the challenges to businesses and employment? Um, then moving into, well, what, where would we like to be? What is the dream? How do we leverage this moment uh, forward and and we all know that we're not going to go back to where we were. So where are we headed? Kind of a, a vision setting moment. Um, and then thinking about what are some of the emerging best practices. And I think Ted uh, did a great job starting to outline some of them, but what are folks doing to respond to the pandemic and what have they been doing? And are there solutions that are replicable and scalable? And we're really keen to capture those. Um, and finally, we'll wind up with the sky's the limit, other big ideas for local, regional, state action, um, anything that could, could help drive us forward to that vision that we want to see. So that's a little bit, hopefully, the narrative arc of where we're going. I just wanted to lay that out in advance. Um, I, I will encourage us to loosely stick to that order. I will do my best to be a gentle and respectful shepherd. Um, but again, in advance, if I'm ever cutting anybody off or trying to move us along, I uh, am just the messenger on this one. So um, with that, let's let's get into it. Uh, I, I'll open it up to whoever, whatever brave soul would like to start identifying what are some of the challenges in Washington County around employment, workforce uh, recovery, business support, um, and what are, what are we seeing? Um, this is Liz Sharp. I can start. I raised my hand, but I'm not sure if you saw it because I might be frozen. 
Um, can you, you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. So I, I work at great. great. I work at Capstone Community Action um, in Barrie, Vermont, and I'm the director of community economic development um, and food security. And uh, we have um, so we oversee um, or one of the programs I oversee is our micro business development program. Um, which works with the more disadvantaged um, micro entrepreneurs. So those who are lower income folks who are primarily sole, entre sole, sole proprietors um, who didn't necessarily benefit from um, a lot of the you know, original um, CARES responses for, for small businesses and actually Ted Brady knows well of the project that the community action agencies have been working on. Um, but um, throw it out there that we do have this, um, this it's not a lot of money, it's a million dollars for the state, uh, statewide, um, which we're giving out grants uh, between $2,500 and $5,000 to um, businesses, micro businesses who have five or fewer employees and who meet our income guidelines, which are 80% of uh, median income or lower. Um, and we do have, we, we haven't used, um, I think we've used up not quite half the money. So there still is around $500,000 that's still available um, for these businesses to access money to help them um, with, uh, you know, purchasing supplies, um, paying back taxes, things that 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 can kind of still keep them keep them afloat. It's called Embrace, and if you were to Google um, any one of the community action websites, um, the link to applying for those grants are on there. Um, or anyone could personal message me, and I could could send that link to them. Um, so that's sort of one of our responses for you know sort of the more. The, this, the very small businesses um, who weren't able to benefit from some of the, um, the, the federal um, programs that were out there initially. Um, we do also have a workforce development program and, and that's been a real challenge for us because it's training um, very sort of underemployed and unemployed people uh, to work in the restaurant industry. So we've really had to um, change our program um, to Focus on um, you know workforce development skills in general, not just how to you know cook and and work in a restaurant because we know that finding jobs for these folks is is not going to be the easiest thing because one a lot of them have never had experience working in a kitchen so they're not going to be the first people to be hired um, when restaurants are hiring. Um, so we're really trying to focus on what are some skills that we can you know. Um, offer that will allow them to get a job any place, you know, not just in, in the restaurant. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a real challenge for us because this is a huge program for us and to suddenly, you know, be in a place where, you know, we're offering a service that doesn't exist right now um, has been challenging. So we're really sort of focusing on either training people for jobs outside of the kitchen, but also the social enterprise. Like, can they do something on their own? Can they create a food truck? Um, and, or can they do something that is you know, in the food industry, but isn't necessarily restaurant related? So that's kind of what's going on in the, in the pulse of the, the low income uh, community in, in central Vermont in, in terms of employment. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Liz. I um, some of the things that I'm hearing just in terms of framing cha specific challenges loud and clear are that some of these smaller businesses or sole proprietors really weren't able to access um, some of the federal programs, support programs that came out in the same way as larger businesses. The ongoing need for workforce development skills um, and so on. So. Yeah, thank you for that. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of virtual hands pop up. So I want to go to Liz and then Lori, and then I see Representative Reed after that. Thanks, Liz Schlegel from the Alchemist Foundation. Um, I guess one thing that rises to mind for me as a question um, uh, for the work of the group is how have you been um, intentional about the nonprofit community 
right? They are, of course, a huge business sector in this state, um, dwarfing most other sectors. And, um, you know, the, they have been hammered, right? Both um, for human service organizations, um, like Liz Sharps, right? The demand for services has increased dramatically and the um, funding is uh, uh, scant. And so, and arts organizations are, you know, dying and all these other organizations, right? Like it, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. And I've been talking to lots and lots of the organizations that I work with. Um, people are, are terrified, right? Like we're, um, we're sad if our restaurant goes away, but, you know, we're kind of screwed if, the theater or the um, humane society goes away, you know, let alone the food shelf, right? So it's just, I'm curious about what um, the group is doing to um, identify that as a sector that needs to be included in these conversations. Sorry, Liz, if, if I'm the only one, you, you just cut out a little bit. So I'm not sure if I'm just starting to talk over you. This is a little bit like facilitating in the dark. Um, I'm hearing that, that question loud and clear, yeah, about um, how are we specifically thinking about nonprofits? I think the figure I've run with in my daily life is that one in 10 Vermonters work in nonprofits, right? So clearly a significant sector. And just to sort of stick with this framing of challenges, um, thinking about, yeah, the ways in which this is, is maybe not cutting across sectors equally or that different sectors may have particular challenges. So um, lo I'm looking at the time. I do want to sort of be starting to transition into like the, what is the dream? Where, where would we like to go? But I'd see a lot of raised hands. So I, I want to go to Lori and then representative Reed. Um, and then if we can sort of be transitioning, I think that will keep us on track. So Lori. Hi. Oh, hold on. Our original question was going to be a specific business question, but Liz, you just reminded me of something. Um, around the not-for-profit piece, all of the um, assistance that's been available so far has only been available to not-for-profits who have employees. And so there's this whole other sector, sector of arts and um, not-for-profit organizations that have a volunteer board and maybe only a volunteer and no volunteer staff, or excuse me, no paid staff. Um, and I'm not sure what future rollouts will look like, um, but how do we help support that sector who are providing services um, and, and uh, lots of great services in our communities, but they haven't qualified for help and they've had to suspend um, their services, which is where their income comes from, right? So one, one group that I think of as a theater group that didn't do theater this summer, so they've had no ticket sales, but they still tried to do some programming for youth, um, but that particular group does not have paid staff, so they couldn't apply for um, the Paycheck Protection Program or any of the other assistance that's been offered so far. Um, so we should think about that for lots of the other not-for-profits in the state um, who are in a similar situation. Um, but the initial reason why I raised my hand, um, and again, this isn't, I don't have an answer for anything, um, but I know Cabot Creamery struggled to find employees and is still struggling right now. They were determined an essential employer early on. All of their office staff has been deployed into the plant to do um, increased production. And I just wonder if there was a way or would be a way to help direct employees who lost their jobs in other sectors to those sectors who have needed work or needed workers. Um, so I just kind of put that out there that if there was a better way for us to coordinate that so that um, folks who needed work were easily directed to where there were places that needed workers. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, I think that's that's great and a, an astute point and kind of a, a natural segue um, to thinking about kind of what, what would we like to see ideally. But I know some people have been waiting. I guess I will challenge us for the sake of sticking with, with our time frame here to, to maybe start thinking about what would we like to see in, in this area? I mean, there's clearly, we could talk for 
the next 60 minutes about the challenges. I mean, clearly this has been months of uh, trauma, real trauma in some cases to, to this community. And so I don't want us to get too, too bogged down in it, but I do, I do want to give space for folks to vocalize if there are other things you're seeing on the ground. Representative Reed, I know you've been waiting for a while, and then I think I have Brian, Robert, and maybe Diane after that. So, Representative? Sure, thanks. Um, just, I, I'm, I'm from the Randolph area, and Roxbury is in my area, so that's why I've got the little bit of Washington County, but I missed the, the Orange County presentation. But um, I think we've, we've to some extent missed an opportunity in our downtowns to provide some support for um, just keeping businesses going, especially the restaurants. And I mean, one of the ideas we have, we've got a big tent and event company in town and they were really advocating for uh, you know, putting up, getting funding from the state to be able to put up tents and other, other sort of covering for people to continue their businesses outdoors. Uh, the window on that's obviously closing, but um, it was, it was a little frustrating because I think there was a lot of discussion about the downtown and whenever it came to funding, that seemed to be sort of the last thing that, that got considered. Um, I, I am seeing some, some interesting um, approaches to the arts uh, again with, with outdoor events. Uh, uh, the Chandler center just did a, uh, a kind of virtual concert recently that uh, exceeded their expectations so that that was nice but it was a, a big program that that they weren't able to offer uh, i would echo the the issue on nonprofits. the the nonprofits in our area have really stepped up and they're doing a great job uh, they've uh they've sort of done what they always do and organize the community and, and tr try to provide mutual support um, so so that's been a, a great reaction and i have to say that the citizens in general have been pretty amazing about stepping forward and, and supporting the local businesses, the restaurants, things like that, to uh, kind of go above and beyond what they might normally do, uh, those that can afford it. But um, we still have the, the challenge of, uh, you know, childcare and some of those other things that are coming along now that we're getting back to school and, and work. Um, I mean, one, the, the workforce question I think is, is important and, and one where I think there's an option for some creativity that I think the child care hubs is one example, which was a great idea that was thrown out, but nobody knows how to staff it. Uh, and one of my constituents suggested uh, we have all these college students that aren't able to go back to college. Is there a way we can sort of retrofit them into doing uh, child care and helping kids with after school programs? Uh, but it's a, it's been a huge undertaking just finding space and things like that. So I guess that focuses a little more on the challenges than where we're, we're going. Um, but I think uh, there, there's definitely some good energy everywhere and I, I'm feeling that. So uh, with a little bit of a uh, catalyst, I think we can, we can probably make some things happen. Thanks representative. Yeah, I mean, I think within what you just said though, there are definitely some, some nuggets of, of possible direction, right? I don't want to get too far ahead. That's our last kind of topic is what are our big ideas? Um, I think it's great this the idea of pairing college students with in a, some sort of child care role. Um, but yeah, so, so I guess now I will turn it, if we can, to what does the best case scenario look like in this arena, um, both in the immediate future and kind of the long term coming out of COVID? I mean, COVID is this transitional moment, we're seeing a lot of really innovative adaptation. Um, where would we like to be? And I guess I'll just like remind the title of this forum, uh, both supporting business and workforce recovery and rethinking employment. I mean, that's a bold uh, phrase. So I, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm sure there's a, a quite a number of deep thinkers on this call. So what 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 is the dream? What's the long term vision? What would we like to see in Washington County? And I see some virtual hands, but I'm not sure if they're old. So not to put you on the spot, Robert, would you like to, to speak to that? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Rob Lambert, and um, for the last three years, I have been uh, working to set up um, a development of a business in Vermont uh, that is designed to take advantage of the fact that there is a high demand 
uh, for carbon sequestration worldwide uh, that companies like uh, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, uh, virtually all the airlines, all the shipping companies are voluntarily uh, buying uh, carbon um, that is uh, auditable, uh, that is verified, that is permanent, that is additional. Uh, there, there are fairly strict standards. Uh, but one thing that um, I, I am planning to do um, at, at any rate um, is to support the uh, climate change um, uh, solutions uh, bill, um, which calls for uh, up to 20% of the emissions reductions to come from uh, this type of source. Uh, I am looking, uh, I would really like to start uh, a metal, metal fabrication business uh, that would use um, welders and, and other people, uh, engineers, um, and build precision uh, kilns uh, that would reduce biomass to uh, carbon uh, that can be then sold on the international market. I'm, I'm um, attempting to put something together. I mean, we know what we've got to do. Um, it's a matter of getting organized. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to establish something that could be could fill a, a variety of roles for uh, people who finished high school and have a good attitude, uh, all the way up to I'm working with um, people that are, are really um, uh, exceptional prototype designers, um, and I'm working um, uh, internationally um, because this type of business is an international business, but it's something that uh, Vermont can do, um, and this is a very good time to get started on that type of thing. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm in the process of looking for capital um, and, and moving forward. I, I'm also running for state representative. So until the election is over, I'm going to be uh, a little bit out of pocket. Uh, there are a couple of other things that, that I would just throw out. And, and these, are, these are sort of longer term types of things when, when um, uh, the health situation um, um, uh, is stable enough to allow uh, for an improvement in tourism. Um, for example, uh, the quarries in Barrie. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a place in Connecticut called Brownstone Park. Uh, it's an old brownstone quarry, uh, and it's been made into uh, a very marvelous uh, water park. Uh, and I'd urge you if, you, if it's if it's something that you'd like to check out, Brownstone Quarry uh, in Connecticut. Um, and, but they've got, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a full blown water park. It would be a, a wonderful tourist attraction, uh, something that one of the ski areas could operate during, during, um, uh, the summer, uh, that could bring a lot of business into Barry. That's something else. I, I was also curious and I, I wanted to explore just for just quickly, uh, what's going on with daycare. I think that, you know, the mentioning, um, that that there are uh, workers needed at Cabot. Well, that that is terrific news. I'm glad that that you know there's work for them to do. Uh, how do they get there? Uh, can we take people um, and and transport them uh, round trip to Cabot, uh, do their work, and then you know come back on sort of a regular schedule, uh, provide them transportation? Uh, can we can we take um, unused office space someplace um, and and provide college students? Uh, to watch the children, to make this as easy as possible for people to step into these roles. Um, so anyway, that's that's a quick overview of of, um, of of my thinking, my uninformed thinking on this matter. Thanks. Uh, no, that's it's clearly somewhat informed, Rob. Um, I think that's it's great. There's a lot to that. I if I can take the liberty of sort of reflecting back some of the things I'm hearing. Um, the opportunity to capitalize on existing assets, uh, the quarries being one of them, the like blossoming market externalities of carbon being one potential way to pivot into the climate economy, if that's an okay phrasing of some of what you were starting to say. And then just this idea that you can't support workforce um, in a sort of economic or financial vacuum, but that childcare and transportation and all of these other sort of staple issues in Vermont are of course going to come into play and, and we really should be thinking holistically about those. So thank you very much for your comments. Um, Brian, I think you've been waiting for a while. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Okowski. I am the superintendent in the Washington Central Unified Union School District. It's a pleasure to be here today. I. Uh, 
was uh, very interested in hearing about the uh, Vermont Council on Rural Development and uh, was very excited to th uh, talking about the idea of rethinking employment. And uh, some of the things is uh, I can just talk about some of my personal experiences uh, coming just coming to Vermont. I, I moved up here from uh, Connecticut uh, several months ago. Uh, the uh, so I've done my quarantine. I've done my quarantine already. So <laughs> many months ago, but uh, I will say that uh, one of the uh, interesting things is I, I think when I look at the challenges and the big ideas, uh, la labor I think is one of the biggest uh, things that I've been seeing. Uh, right now we have we've reopened schools in my uh, school district. We're one of uh, I think five school districts in the entire state that have uh, re been able to reopen uh, full full. Uh, full in-person instruction uh, for our, for our young children from a pre-K to a sixth grade. Uh, so we're, we're pretty proud of that. And one of the uh, reasons we're able to do that, we have uh, the, we have a lot of space in our buildings or we have a, we have a lot of, um, we have lots of rooms in our buildings and we can spread out much, uh, much better than probably some other districts. Uh, but I've heard that uh, over the years that the number of children are also uh, getting lower uh, in, uh, in the uh, state of Vermont. And so I think about the, uh, the labor, some of the labor issues. And so I have 12 openings right now. Um, none of them are teachers, thankfully, but they still looking for custodians, looking for power educators. Uh, and uh, we're lo also looking for uh, other types of positions along those lines. So when Lori said that, you know, she's talking about cabin, I hear that on the radio every day, they're definitely looking for workers. You drive down route two, people are looking for workers. And I, my big question is, uh, I, I think about my wife. My wife uh, was a, is a, a registered nurse uh, when we, uh, and she uh, is over at Central Vermont Medical Center. And when she uh, came into applying for the job at Central Vermont Medical Center, which is located in Berlin, uh, there were over 70 plus jobs available. And I just thought about that. Like, can you imagine if they had filled all those jobs, um, how many people would be paying taxes, you know, uh, just, just uh, contributing to the Vermont economy. And then I thought about my, where I did my internship as a superintendent uh, in East Hartford, East Hartford, Connecticut, East Hartford high school had a special program where the um, children, if they wanted to, could go into graduate from high school with an LPN uh, degree. And uh, so they didn't have to pay for it. it. It was part of their program. And when they came out, uh, they were able to, um, they didn't have debt or anything like that. They just came in and they could hit the ground running and start working. And many of those kids become RNs. And then they be start uh, filling a lot of the jobs that need to be filled in that area. And so uh, I thought about my wife when she graduated, uh, her uh, LPN, she was $60,000 in debt. So I thought about, Wow! Imagine if uh, she where was that program when when she was uh, uh, growing up? So what uh, she'd be able to pay her taxes and contribute to to uh, the uh, the local economy? I think in a much much more greater way. So I think that you know I think about those types of things and I wonder how can the schools help? Uh, are schools being asked or expected to prepare the workforce of the future? Uh, there seems to be a lot of jobs. Uh, you know, even just for example at Berlin in Berlin in a at the Central Vermont Medical Center, just as an example, I'm sure there's probably examples like that throughout the state. And wouldn't it be great to have high schools or, or these types of programs offering uh, our students are an opportunity to um, get into a field, maybe get it hit the ground running when they graduate high school, uh, and maybe even have a leg up in getting in, not having college debt to getting into um, an opportunity to contribute right away. And so I, you know, so I, the way I look at it is. You know, are we going to, uh, in order to keep the economy going, are we going to look at, uh, you know, importing folks from other places, other states to fill our, our labor needs? Or are we going to try to grow our own um, uh, or try to take some of the folks who did lose their jobs uh, and try to re re redefine what they can do? So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Brian. Uh, definitely a perennial tension in Vermont, for sure. Um, and I think you hit on a lot. I definitely hearing this, I mean, I you hear everywhere this need for school integration with workforce and shorter pipelines to, to um, meaningful employment. So yeah, I really appreciate that. I do, I wanna, again, I mean, we can could spend 
endless amounts of time talking about any one of these specific things. I see Alyssa's hand up and I see Senator Cummings next. So I want to go to you guys, but I want to open it up as you're um, making observations or comments, not only now, wh where would we like to go, but any uh, existing promising practices or strategies that you guys are seeing on the ground um, that are kind of sending us in that direction or things that can be replicated. Um, I'd love to start capturing some of those. I've been jotting down like the micro business uh, program at Capstone, some of the stuff in the Randolph area, Representative Reed was talking about the virtualization of business, et cetera. So any other things that people are seeing now would be a great time to, to start airing some of those out. So Alyssa, let's go to you first. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa. I work in Waterbury um, doing economic development. And when I think about dreams and where I want to be, um, I would say it's interesting that I probably know or know of um, more than half the people on this call professionally. And I think I dream of a future where we're getting input maybe from a few more people who I don't know professionally. Not that I don't want to hang out and have Zoom calls with all of you, but I do think it's really worth acknowledging the businesses that aren't being represented in this conversation and kind of what thoughts those people who who don't do this all day, every day, um, have about those issues in terms of things that work well. I actually think this virtual new world is exciting. As someone who spends a lot of time in municipal meetings, it can be really nice to be in my kitchen and be able to comment on the latest planning commission draft and uh, again, not have to get childcare or drive to the town offices. So I hope we figure out ways to um, have that be hybrid and keep doing it where it's important. Um, I think another thing that's worked well and is exciting to try and continue is just being able to provide one-on-one -on -one support, um, both for businesses and individuals. Um, Waterbury chooses to have a lot of capacity in this department, at least in businesses, by paying me. Um, and I'm still one person for probably 200 businesses. And even now we hear of folks who you know, don't quite understand all the programs that are out there that months after the economic recovery grants, they still thought the threshold was 75%. So they haven't applied. And until someone gives them a phone call or that extra nudge, they're, they're not there yet. Um, so to me, again, that's something that works for businesses and individuals. And it's really about having someone sit down and understand your specific individual circumstance and be able to provide resources and follow up in a way that's more than just a referral. I do a lot of referrals and sometimes it can feel kind of heartbreaking. So thinking about that, that could be a job for more folks to do. Um, and it's just, it's being a cheerleader. It's supporting folks as they're navigating these programs and following up um, to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, again, for individuals and businesses, um, keep collaborating regionally. I think fortunately we do a lot of that in that region, but it's been exciting to have even more of it happen and to have that hopefully keep up, thinking about creative ways to integrate local food. Um, hope that we have a lot of really awesome internet in the future, definitely something to dream about and keep supporting those local initiatives that are doing that. Um, and I hope that we have a tourism and hospitality sector. So I have to say, as someone who works in Waterbury, I'm really you know, excited to hear about kind of dedicated support in that area. Um, and the last thing I would say, I think financial literacy is a really interesting tie-in, um, whether it's kind of educational, some of what Brian was talking about, but I feel that it personally, I've been able to navigate this because I have a really strong handle on where I stand and a lot of financial resources, but um, both for, again, business owners, particularly some of those sole proprietor individuals or a business as a whole, um, you kind of got to lay it all out so that you can figure out how to navigate the future. Um, and then also just working to become more inclusive and welcoming. So that was my wide inch, inch deep, but uh, thanks all. No, th that's great. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, and I'm just noticing a couple things happening in the chat I wanna highlight. First, since we are talking about um, pro existing promising practices, I think Liz um, Scharf had posted a link to, no, I'm not, uh, can't, no, Liz Schlegel, uh, candidates that could would be interested in working with school age children. There's a form through Vermont After School for folks to get um, in touch. So that's a specific resource. There's a little bit of conversation about um, the career centers and hope to, I see Michelle's hand up. So hopefully we can go there in a second. Um, but I do, I, I wanna go to Senator Cummings who's had her hand up for a while and um, 
yeah, keep thinking on about what are some things that we're seeing that are working. Um, I guess I, I think Diane Derby is probably the only one that might remember the great Montpelier flood in the early nineties. And I was mayor and therefore was very involved in downtown recovery. It's deja vu, but it's not because at that time and, and with Irene, we knew what we had to do. And the idea was you, the police chief, we had everybody in morning and evening and we said, okay, this is what we're doing. Today you take out the trash, you know, the, the but the buildings were destroyed. And so it was a matter of getting money to people to rebuild, to restock, to clean out the trash. On this one, the buildings are there. The inventory is there. And there is no roadmap for this. We have not been through this kind of, we've not been through a pandemic. Um, and so we are really rebuilding as we go. And there really aren't proven strategies because we haven't done it before. Um, I think it's important that we talk. I'm not seeing at least any of the business owners who talk to me when Montpelier um, you know, economic uh, development by Pelia downtown had us in um, because they're all working and they're home. And I think we do need to talk with them. I sent them all emails and asked, what do you really need? And they haven't gotten back to me. I, I think that's the question. What we've got, the economy is huge. If, if we want to focus on downtowns, we can do that. The hospitality and downtown and food, um, we, can, we can focus on those and figure out what works there. But I, I'm not on economic development. I don't know how our manufacturing or our tech or our service, you know, internet service kinds of industries are doing. I mean, 10% of us are unemployed, but that still means 90% of us are employed. And I, I just, I feel the need to have a better understanding. And I, I really came tonight to listen, to see if I can figure out how do we target the limited resources we have at the state level, which is federal money, um, because the state's also not in stellar financial shape. Um, how do we target the federal money to do the most good for the most businesses? And I'm, I'm getting a sense that it is our downtowns, our food service, our hospitality, um, Maybe we need to make the Vermont, the state workers come back to Montpelier, but I think that's what it's going to take to, to get Montpelier up and running. That, I mean, I've been trying for years to get state workers into downtown Barrie so their downtown can look like Montpelier's. Um, it's having an employer with active employees downtown and people that live downtown are crucial to having your downtowns flourish. And that might be something we can talk about. Yeah, thank you, Senator. I, I, I think I'm hearing in what you're saying a lot of kind of echoes of what Alyssa was pointing out, this kind of insular group of um, people who work within the field of economic development and sometimes we could do a better job in sort of opening channels of communication beyond. And I think it speaks to what you were saying about not necessarily feeling like you always have the best pulse on what the needs are. So I'm wondering, I wanna 
uh, working my way through virtual hands, but I'll put that out there as a standing question. There may be people on this call who feel a little bit better equipped to speak to that. I know certainly Jamie will have some thoughts um, and looking forward to hearing his reflections at the end. Um, but let's go now to Curtis. Uh, things that you're seeing that are really working on the ground. And just again, guys, looking at the time, um, also th things that we are seeing or could be seeing or ideas for the future. I think it's it's wide open at this point. So let's, let's dream big. So Curtis. Yeah, I was gonna uh, answer both uh, Brian's and uh, Liz Scharf's concerns. Um, part of that though would be the CTEs and I'll leave that to Michelle because I think she's more of the, she has more expertise on that, but there's a, there's a lot going on there. But in Vermont Tech, we're working right now with the Vermont Community Foundation and the McClure Foundation on uh, best bets in, in, in uh, career education. Um, what VCF is looking at is what Dan Smith is calling, how can we help the learners in transition? And transition can either mean going from high school into a job, maybe not college, but maybe getting some career skill. Um, but the others are those, maybe those, the waiters, waitresses, the cooks, the people who are unemployed really want to get a different career. So at Vermont Tech, we're offering, we offer quite a few of those opportunities, mostly through our CEWD, Continuing Education and Workforce Development, uh, but also through some of our certificate programs. So I just wanted to say there's a, there are many options there that um, to look at for not necessarily the businesses themselves, but for the employees who are affected or the, the people who are on unemployment. But again, I'll let Michelle talk about the CTEs. Um, that's not my area of expertise. You're muted, Nick. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, yeah, Michelle, maybe you could speak uh, to speak to that. Well, so Curtis, you recall that that's my old hat, but it's still my number one passion is workforce development. But so I encourage you, Curtis and Brian, welcome Brian Okowski to Vermont because you are a voice that can help expand high school, you know, K through 12 technical education in the state and coordinate it with our colleges, which is really what we need in spades. But I now work with the Vermont Employee Ownership Center and I just wanna say that historically, we've worked with transitions of mostly retiring employers wanting to sell to their employees, but we are now heavily working in the startup space and there's huge opportunity with businesses closing and businesses transitioning to utilize the resources of existing talent and unemployed workers to get them started again. And we have serious nationally recognized technical expertise at VEOC. And we have both, uh, we have debt and capital that is available uniquely for employee ownership. So I encourage people to be in touch with us, veoc.org, and we are on the ground working very closely with the SPDC and others. So just keep that in mind when you see any opportunities or you see a, a tired business owner who says, I've had it, it's just too much to rebuild. What do I do? Send him or her to us. We can talk to them about keeping that business going. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks all. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, and then that's great. That's a very tangible, um, very real thing, uh, resource out there. Um, Diane has had her hand up for a long time. I do uh, want to go to Diane. I'll try to chime in while my dog's not barking. Thanks for having me. I just wanted to give a quick federal overview. And I think, um, you know, if we're talking big ideas and challenges, uh, no one knows more than Senator Leahy what a challenge it is to try to get another major COVID relief bill passed. Um, that would be his top priority right now. He's still working very hard to get it done, but as I'm sure you're, you have all read, it's quite a challenge in DC right now to, to get that over the line. Uh, you know, we know what works. The last major COVID relief bill, um, you know, we had $1.25 billion to pass along to the legislature and the governor because, you know, we know that the state and local people know best where these these funds 
should and can be spent. Um, and what we heard loud and clear after that major $2.2 trillion package was the need for more flexibility for states. You know, that they had to spend all of that money down by December 31st, and we know the constraints that that uh, puts on, on people. Um, businesses and, and nonprofits and everyone. Um, so, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons from the last COVID bill. And, you know, we know that the best thing we could do at the federal level, and Senator Leahy's working really hard, is to get another bill, bill uh, passed. So, you know, he is still holding out hope uh, that, we, that we can do it, another bill soon. Um, that said, you know, uh, there were some real really uh, effective targeted programs that Ted can speak better to than I can. But, you know, we had the 5 million carve out for women and, and minority owned businesses. We had some targeted funding. Um, oh, and I'll also say that that major package did not include all of the other funding to say NEA, NEH, where money went directly from the National Endowment of the Arts and Humanities to states to, to help the uh, Vermont Arts Council and Vermont Humanities Council put out grants. Now, we all know that those grants didn't go far enough and, and didn't pay for the lost revenues from lack of ticket sales and that kind of thing to speak to the points that were made earlier. Um, so, you know, we certainly understand that so much more is needed from the federal level and the Senator will just keep on working to try to get something over the finish line on that front. We're also still working on a fiscal year 21 budget that we haven't been able to finalize with the fiscal year ending in two weeks. So um, a lot of challenges at the federal at the federal level. But um, you know, Senator Cummings and everyone in the legislature and the governor's office did a phenomenal job of working to get you know a lot of money. 1.25 billion dollars is a lot of money to get out the door to try to target that and and frankly they're much better equipped at the state and local levels to target that money than we are at the federal level so we know what works we just got to do more of it and senator Leahy is really trying and i'll just say on a personal level i've lived and worked in montpelier for 30 years and um 30 plus years and it really um it's going to be a challenge we're seeing storefronts go out uh, regularly in downtown and it really hurts all of us who who live here personally to just on an emotional level to see that happening so you know i i'm all about hearing more as a person on a personal level as a resident um hearing about more strategies at the local level for montpelier so thanks for having me on feel free to reach out to the office yeah. or otherwise thanks Thank you, Diane, and, and thanks for that update. Um, I I want to highlight, I'm, I'm seeing a lot going on in the chat, which I'm just now catching up to. Um, hopefully people are engaging with that as they're able. Um, some discussion of the Everyone Eats program, which started down in Brattleboro and I think is sort of migrating its way across the state. That's a program to sort of partner with restaurants um, and increase food access. Uh, Curtis put in a, a thing about so, some more of the programming Vermont Tech offers for high school seniors to integrate with the Vermont Academy of Science and Technology. Um, and so, yeah, just, just to highlight those, I do see a hand up from Robert, just a sort of time check. I want to, in about uh, five to seven minutes turn to our visiting team. Uh, we just heard from Diane. Thank you, Diane. You're ahead of the program. Um, but I, I want to give Jamie a chance to, to share some thoughts and reflections and resources from his uh, office and, and his perspective, and then maybe get come back to Ted and, and hear, Ted, some of your reflections. So with that in mind, um, Robert, any final ideas or strategies or, or things you're thinking about? No, I'm sorry. I had a leftover hand up. I'll pass. Oh, okay, no problem. Then I see Michelle's got a hand up, or maybe that's a leftover too. I thought I put it down, but I must have put it back up. Sorry. Okay, well, that, that simplifies that. Well, then anybody else? Um, is there any, what, what have we missed so far? I mean, are there other either 
existing programs, things that are going on that seem to be really having an impact? Yeah, I see Liz's hand just popped up. I guess I would just say, um, you, you know, we have to focus really hard on not going back. We don't want to go back, right? We need to go forward. We need to go to workplaces that are much more diverse, that are much more flexible, that are much more supportive of employees, right? If anything, we've all learned, um, you know, I was chatting with one of my buddies in the intro part and I was like, you know, this is the most stressful time any of us will ever have. It's a six month Irene and we are not done anywhere close to done, but we really need to encourage people not to think about going back, right? The combination of COVID, climate and racial justice is like an extreme moment in history. And so in every area, we need to say, what can we do differently? Right? Do we need that certificate or can we train people on the job? Do we need to bring people back to the office or can we let them be remote? Do we need to have this process work the way it's always worked? Right, The, the businesses that I'm talking to, they get stuck when they think about how it was. They get freed when we can talk to them about it's never going to be like that again. How can you leverage this time where everything is on the table? And I just want to like really make a pitch for that kind of thinking, right? There's no, we don't want to go back. We don't want to go back to the world we had. It didn't work. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. I, I mean, I think you just hit the nail on the head and really tapped into the whole um, raison d'etre of these conversations and, and, I think why we're all probably here on a, uh, at least in my neck of the woods, beautiful, now dark uh, Thursday evening, sitting on our computers talking about development, right? Is there really is this transformational moment and, and how do we seize that? So thank you for highlighting that. Um, I see Representative Reed has a hand up. I think that's probably gonna be about the last uh, one we have time for before I uh, turn it over to the visiting team. So Representative Reed, any uh, concluding remarks? Just a, a quick comment. I think Alyssa mentioned it, but um, as, as we look at, at transforming our economy, broadband across the state is just a critical uh, kind of backbone to that whole process. And, and I think it's something we, we need to just continue pushing on I and mean, we've seen in the in the last six months how critical it is I, I am fortunate to live in an area that has ec fiber and that's fantastic but uh i mean we see it in our in our house uh, uh deliberations people cut out and disappear it's uh, uh and i'm sure for those of you trying to do work or education it's the same thing and so we're we're just not going to be able to move forward in the way we'd like until we have that Totally agree. As I said, I, I feel like I'm living the reality of that. I, and I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones that I can, I do have some level of connectivity, right? I mean, this is, this is such a huge issue. Um, and I have to say in every, I am in a lot of conversations about the future of Vermont by virtue of my job and position. And it's, uh, it's everywhere, right? It's really hard to talk about anything these days without without touching on broadband. So thanks, uh, Representative, for that. Um, so then, as promised, uh, I'd like to turn now to our visiting team and maybe start with Jamie. You've been uh, really patiently and quietly waiting here. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on reflections on the conversation, um, maybe strategies you're seeing from your office's perspective and any resources that might be relevant. Um, so the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Nick. Um, number one, I'm not going to give you a full sales pitch on what we have because number one, there's gonna be some big announcements next week and they'll have to wait till next week. Oh, it's Jerry Stewart, I hate him. So many choices. <laughs> well, Liz, sorry to hear that. Um, the uh, <laughs> bottom line is that um, we really, uh, I wanna, give a more positive note, I think, than many people have been kind of feeling. And it's very typical in going out there that there's a lot of depression uh, out there regarding the situation we have, because it's bad. 
And I think, all right, so if we just accept the fact that it's that, that it's bad, but then look at how we've responded to date. This state has done an amazing job and it's because of the people that are here. And businesses have found and shown a way to be resilient in this that is to me just been really um, uplifting. I've seen a lot of businesses that have really done some amazing things to find ways to adapt and adjust to what is here. Um, at the same point, sure, we have a lot of businesses that are really struggling. And so Senator Cummings and I, you know, Ted and I can tell you, you know, cause we've talked to, I think at this point, it's how many hundreds of businesses in this region and for Ted across the state that we've had direct conversations with um, one of the biggest problems that we all face here is that we everybody's problems are different. We don't have a single need, and some industries are faring fairly well. Other industries are suffering um, to significant extremes and every point in between. So trying to decide on how to fix it, what to fix, uh, it's very difficult. And so I would tell you that that, I think, is our biggest struggle, is trying to identify where and how people need that help because they are so varied. Um, so I think that has got to be the challenge to everybody is to understand that we will have to take multiple approaches for the next year, two years, three years as we rebuild this thing, as we restructure how we do business. And yeah, digital, you know, everybody's saying broadband, but it's the broader digital world. Zoom, six months ago, none of us here were proficient at Zoom. Now we all wish we bought stock in it six months ago because this is a new world. What I'm hearing now from people is comments at meetings. Well, you know what? Even after this is done, we're still gonna do some meetings this way because it's just so much darn convenient. So what is that gonna mean to our downtowns, to the real estate? We've really gotta be thinking about how we bring a new vibrancy, a new demand to the downtowns because it's not going to be the office space anymore. That's just, that's a past reality. And I, those are the terms that we want to start thinking forward on is because this is a time for systemic change. Whether we wanted it or not, it has happened and it is here and it is going to make a lasting change for everybody. So we have to relook at every piece of what we're doing. And even most importantly, the strategies that we've been employing to this point to find a new way forward because the old strategies, it's not that they're old thinking, it's that they will not work because we have changed. And I think that, that I'll kind of leave it at that and as more of a challenge to everybody to figure out how we can all engage in that part of the conversation. Nick, I didn't want to go too long. I didn't know how much time. Uh, thank you, Damian. And, and, and I just, the one thing- No, that, that's great. You, you... Let me, yeah, I was go just going to say to people, I, if there's questions that you have, I, I, I hope that there could still be a little bit of dialogue even now. Definitely, yeah. And I, I'd like to, oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead, Liz. Sorry. Um, so, Jamie, in, re, in response to your um, statement that, you know, thinking about like the office buildings and towns, um, you know, my, I, I'm thinking, and, and I'm thinking in the bigger picture, like New York City, for example, right? Like, which is filled with office buildings. It's like, don't you see that um, the, the future may be that landlords require businesses to rent um, a certain portion of the building? Um, because we, we all work fairly, professional people seem to be working fairly successfully at home. And it would be great for businesses not to have to pay for space when their employees can be working from home, which does a disservice overall to a business when you know you're you're not in person. Um, but so so I sort of envision that landlords are going to um, require businesses to uh, rent out, you know, based on the company size. If the company has a hundred employees that they require 80 percent of the, that space to be rented out not two offices for a handful of people that have to be there because otherwise 
it's the demise of our downtown. Like there's, there's, you know, you, no one's going to be, we're all going to be holed up in our houses so that companies can save money, um, not paying for space. I mean, that's my concern. And I think that we really need to think about like getting back into business buildings and, and working there. Thanks, Liz. Uh, yeah, Jamie, uh, any quick uh, response, reflection on on what Liz was saying? I, yeah, I just think there's an inevitability here, and there's going to be a competitive market to get those uh, that smaller amount of commercial demand. So there's going to be a sea change, whether we and there's at some level, I don't think that we can stop that from happening. Um, so rethinking, and how about some of those properties that historically were housing and apartments? Uh, that were converted to office space? Should they be going back into housing? Should we have a big push to create housing downtown so that we have a population that is based there, that will shop there, and that will keep it vibrant? You know, I, I think that's the point. So we just have to think differently and we've got to look at other answers because we can't change the new reality. Thanks, Jamie. Um, just being a slave to the clock here, I, I do want to give a little bit of time at the end just to walk us through getting back. So um, I, I know, Diane, you spoke a little bit earlier. Do you have any quick uh, brief reflections on the conversation? Any last words you'd like to add? Um, sorry, I jumped the gun on my earlier comments. I forgot I'm supposed to wait till the end. Um, I think That's it's okay. the conversation we all have to be having right now. So. Thanks for pulling us all together. I think all of the people here on the call have spoken to all to the difficulty and challenges. And um, hats off to all of those of you in the trenches who are working so hard to to move forward. And I, frankly, I like Liz Schlegel's comment quite a bit about you know thinking forward and not back. As I, I sent her a note saying building back better, but. I think that's been taken already, so I have to be careful there. But it's uh, <laughs> it's a challenge just we're collectively all facing. But um, I, you know, we'll just work through it all together. So thanks for having me, and I'll listen in. That's great. Thank you, Diane. And um, on that note, on the conversation we all need to be having, uh, Ted. You opened us up. Maybe you could uh, bring us home here. What What do you think? What have you heard? And um, any closing reflections? Well, to build off of Diane and Liz and so many others, I do wonder what it means not to look back and to instead look forward. And to that, I question what What are we trying? What problems do we need to address? And what problems can we address going forward by inventing the future in a different way? You think about you know, what were our major problems before this crisis hit? Hard to think back to February and say what kept you up at night. I think it was the fact that our state was in an unsustainable course to uh, the future. We didn't have uh, enough Vermonters to keep us moving forward. Climate change, uh, that continues to exist. I think both of those issues will continue to be a major force that we need to address when we come back, when, when, when we build our future economy. Uh, our workforce development needs uh, continue to be, despite spending so much money on workforce development, uh, not delivering for the workforce of tomorrow. What a great opportunity to pause and say, how can we do it differently? And, and I, I, that's, I hear that all the time. I honestly don't know what it means. And I don't mean this as an insult, but when I hear it, I oftentimes wonder, and when I think it, if I'm being too Pollyannish and saying, oh, we can do everything perfect, we can fix <laughs> social racism, we can fix uh, climate change just by doing things differently after COVID. But then you start thinking, you know, each one of those problems, one, on our population dynamics and on our demographic dynamics, uh, Vermont is the safest place in the country, period, right now, period, before COVID. Vermont was one of the safest places in the country. That is such an authentic, powerful brand that we should be using uh, in a way that we never have before. When you think about climate change, the number one uh, thing that Vermont does wrong when it comes to climate emissions is transportation. 
Right. You look at the two lowest uh, transportation uses, sorry, the, the two biggest reductions in transportation usage in the state of Vermont happened in August this year, August 3rd and August 23rd. We had the greatest drop in automobile usage in the state of Vermont. This is six months after the pandemic started. So low hanging fruit, it's not Pollyannish to think, how can Vermont solve our, uh, contribute to solving climate change? There's a great opportunity there. Uh, when I think about, uh, you know, social injustice, everybody's thinking about things so differently right now. And we've stopped connecting with people in the same way we did before. What happens when we go back to in-person conversations and bring all of the baggage that's come with us? I think there is an opportunity there. Uh, so all of these things, it's, it's tempting to say you, you can't really go back to a new normal. Well, yeah, you can. It's just you need to think about what are your assets? What 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 has COVID-19 given us? And let's keep some of those crazy things. I, I've heard a lot of that uh, tonight. Uh, and ultimately, though, it comes down to what Senator Cummings was questioning, is what, what do people actually need? And I think we're finding quickly that businesses need customers. <laughs> it's an easy one. So in, without customers, what do we have to give them? the equivalent of what customers give them money. Uh, what do people need? I think it's people need more flexibility. So employers need to be more flexible going forward whenever they can be. Certain percent of jobs can't be, but there's flexibility in how you learn, flexibility in how your kids learn, flexibility in how you work, flexibility in what a working Vermonter looks like. A 10 hour week is a real thing for some Vermonters. So let's use it if they're willing to do that. Um, and Think about the ultimate thing that Washington County has going for it, which is there's no part of Vermont, I think, that has a stronger sense of place than Washington County. Uh, and COVID-19 hasn't begun to touch that magic that, that Washington County has. So some, some gibberish there, I know, but ultimately it comes down to, yeah, let's grow differently. Let's use what COVID gave us and use that as the building blocks of how we grow, how we recover differently. Don't don't think that we can just reinvent everything. Let's use what COVID's given us. And um, uh, Vermont has never been stronger and in a better position to lead the nation. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, I, I think that's a, what a great way to wrap up. Um, and if I can just uh, jump off of some of what you were saying. I mean, I guess I'll just share the brief reflection before I get into technological steward mode. Um, like I say, having done a number of these and, and just listening to the tone and timbre of these conversations, I'm struck by how much um, we as a, a people and we as, as the small subsect of the population who come together on these, these Zoom calls, of course, acknowledging that how the conversation really always seems to follow a similar narrative arc to me of like, and part of that is the structure, right? But really, I think there's just something to be said for the collective um, will to roll up sleeves and get things done. And and when it, I guess I'm stammering to say that it's just humbling to be a part of these conversations and see so many people who will take time out of their evening to come and talk about these issues. Um, and I think Ted just spoke to it really well. I mean, it's what new normal looks like is is totally reliant on capital U us and and all of you guys. And and so it's what uh, an honor in a way to be a part of this. And um, just really appreciate you all taking the time to be here and and love seeing some connections be made and affirmed. And um, yeah, so thank you, thank you all so much for that. Um, I guess then it's a matter of getting back to the closing session. We are right on schedule here. So um, I'm just copying and pasting to the chat. It's the exact same process that brought us here. So you're going to want to copy the link that I just posted into the chat, leave this meeting, and then uh, put that link back into your browser and you should get magically whisked back to the right place. Um, and if you're calling in on the phone, which I don't think anybody is, um, it would be different. But so with that, thank you guys all one more time. Um, and I will see you in the 
in the closing session.